Hey everyone, welcome back to another video and today we are once again going to be talking about poetry. Now, this was going to be just like a good versus bad poetry video and I was going to like kind of make it into a thing where we talk about lots of bad poetry around the same theme and lots of good poetry around the same theme and take lots of different poets from all different places, but all my bad poetry examples ended up being from Atticus. So this is kind of sort of an Atticus focused review, but also not. That said, I have spent so long these last uh, two weeks or whatever it is reading Atticus books and poetry that I'm just thoroughly exhausted by how bad his work is and I do get quite snarky in this review at times so you'll have to excuse me for that but my snark is backed up by actual kind of like reasoning and I guess evidence <laughs> and stuff like that. I've tried to be as fair as I can in places but also I'm quite emotional so just bear that in mind as we go forward with this video, please. That said, as always, my focus with these poetry videos, especially when I compare good and bad poetry, is to talk about what makes a poem good or bad and how do we identify those features? What should you be looking out for? And ultimately, does it really matter if a poem is good or bad or not? Now, before we jump into any solid examples and the meat of this video, the first thing I wanna say is, of course, whether you like poetry or not is completely subjective. There's no right or wrong, and it's absolutely okay to like or dislike whatever poetry you want. Neither I nor anyone else can tell you otherwise. Despite how snarky I get towards Atticus, honestly, if you like his stuff, good for you there's nothing wrong with that and I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong I'm just gonna be snarky from my own perspective and the same goes for all art if it means something to you if you can get something out of it if you enjoy it that's never gonna be a bad thing and never let anyone else tell you otherwise you know I can sit here and say well I hate his poetry for this reason and this reason and this reason but I can't tell you what to feel about it and I never will. However, with poetry, just like any other art form, there are some things that are a little more objective about it. We can pick out specific techniques and comment on whether they've been done well or not, or used well or not. We can comment on if they've been used with purpose, if the artist has achieved the effect or meaning that they were going for and aiming for. These are, like I say, slightly more objective things, and these are the ways we can say if a poem or any other piece of art is good or bad from a technical level, but this isn't an all-encompassing label at all. I mean, look at these two pictures of dogs. Technically, one is very good and one is very bad, but I know which one makes me smile more. I know which one I enjoy more, and I know which one I'd wanna hang up in my house. Honestly, both of them, I just love dogs. And it's the same for poetry and literature in general. I mean, in regards to books, I recently picked back up the Bridgerton books by Julia Quinn, and I've made a video about them before, specifically books one and five, I believe, and I just finished reading book six. And the more I read, the more I can say, objectively, they are terrible. My God, they are so bad. They're poorly written with poorly sought out characters who are all basically the same person. There's no suspense. There's nothing really exciting that happens. They're all basically the same story. They're so predictable. They're really, really bad, but they're still kind of fun and addicting to read. And they're a bit of a guilty pleasure read, to be honest. And for some reason, I keep picking them back up and vaguely enjoying them. Not so much the last one. It was really, really bad, but at least the first few I did really enjoy. Compare that to something like Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, which I know from a technical perspective is a fantastic book, but I have picked that book up so many times and no many how many times I attempt it, I just can't get into it and I can't enjoy it and I've never finished it yet because I just can't do it. So you have an objectively bad book that I enjoy, an objectively good book that I don't enjoy, and that's okay. Despite the things we label as good or bad or whatever, um, no one is saying you only have to consume technically good art, and no one here is even telling you what you have to think is good or bad. But the aim of this video, and in fact all my poetry videos and poetry content, is to try and get you to appreciate poetry as an art form from a slightly more technical perspective maybe, and to help you understand the work that goes into crafting a good poem, and to help you appreciate the nuances and the deeper layers of a good piece of work, and to help you understand the specifics of why you might like one piece of work and not another, and also to help you understand why people like myself get so annoyed with like Instagram poets like Atticus and RH Sin 
and uh, D-Man and to some extent Rupee Kaur and all those people. I'm not here to shame the bad poems that I use as examples, although, well that wasn't my goal, but honestly I do get really snarky Atticus in this. But the aim ultimately is to try and make you think a little more about the media you're consuming and make you think about why we do give some poets more credit than others and why it's maybe not really fair that someone like Atticus gets all these accolades and money and title of being a bestseller when clearly the work hasn't really gone into his books in the same way it has to maybe like an unknown indie poet who is an absolute genius on a technical perspective and produces really good work but the marketing just isn't really there for them. Basically what I'm trying to say is commercial success isn't everything and I want to try and make people think about that a little bit more. With all that in mind, let's jump into the meat of this video. So today we are going to be comparing some works of poetry, all centred around the theme of describing women that you love, or you're attracted to, or you might be falling for. Seriously, there's a lot of poetry written about that. We are going to be comparing some of the work from Atticus, because that seems to be the theme of like 75% of his work, and we are going to be comparing that with some serious poets throughout history who have done the same thing, but better. And I'm going to try and make sure that the poems I use to compare, there's something for everyone in here. I am sadly limited on time, so I can't talk about all the poetry that I want to. I am going to be making some comparisons with absolute classics and traditional poetry, like um, some excerpts from Shakespeare's plays, some stuff from John Donne. We're going to gender swap and look how women write about men by looking briefly at Christina Rossetti, who is an absolute favourite of mine. And then we're going to be looking at a few more contemporary pieces uh, from poets with a wider range of cultural backgrounds, like the incredible Langston Hughes, another one of my favourites. We have a little mention of Ian D Duig, who is an Irish poet, and uh, Yehuda Amachai, who, or Amakai, who is, I want to say, an Israeli poet. So basically the point I'm trying to make is if you don't like one of the poems that I'm discussing and talking about, wait five minutes I'll probably move on to one that you do. Hopefully there's something for everyone in here. And if you're interested, I do have a big long list of poetry recommendations over on my website that I've compiled for you. Again, it's by no means an exhaustive list and I'm adding to it all the time. And there's almost definitely a lot of books on there that I've forgotten about, but I just keep adding to it and building to it all the time. So hopefully you'll find something to inspire you over there. Let's start with Atticus, a poet who likes to cover his face and hide his real name, and yet is still a bestseller. But then again, if I was putting out the quality of work that he does, I would also probably want to hide my face and name, so who can blame him? His work exhausts me. I am going to be completely blunt now and a little bit snarky. It is lazy and it is boring. He writes these 200 page books where most of the pages are blank, except the ones that he fills with generic little scribbles and rambles and generic black and white photos that he didn't even take. It's just all very bland and boring and basic, but he does manage to do one impressive thing. None of his poetry collections have a coherent theme running throughout. They're just like this hodgepodge of writing carelessly thrown together, yet at the same time, all of his writing just blends into one. There's not really anything to distinguish one poem from the next. There's nothing unique or interesting about them. So, his books managed to be a homogenous blob and a cacophonous mess at the same time. Just kind of impressive in its own right, if you like that, which I don't. See what I mean? I'm being a little bit harsh, but I've been so engrossed in his work for the last however many days and weeks that it's just chipped away at my faith in humanity and now I'm just a <sighs> grumpy mess. That said, I can see some positives in his work. Even though there's no depth to any of it, his books definitely look pretty at a glance and they have nice covers and they look quite good on the shelf if you don't open them. And the fact he writes about such generic topics using very simple languages and very simple sentences and there's nothing complex about it means that his work is very accessible to a very wide audience. So I can see the benefit to books like this because I like to think of them as sort of a gateway drug but for poetry. You start with something like Atticus because it seems approachable, it seems easy, it's not going to overwhelm you, and then once you kind of feel comfortable and confident in that, you can go on to more harder hitting, higher quality poetry. So from that respect, I can't really complain about the books too much, because honestly anything that gets new people interested in poetry can't be all bad in my book, you know? And to be honest, if we stopped calling this kind of writing poetry and instead called it a collection of notes or thoughts or word doodles. Is that a thing? I'm gonna make it a thing. If we stop calling it poetry and called it something like that, then I can absolutely see why it might be nice for some people to read this stuff and just use it as like a bit of a, a bit of a pick-me-up to like feel better about themselves on bad days and stuff like that. So there's a positive there, I guess. 
but let's look at the kind of more technical aspect of this poetry and to do that we need to read some. All the poems I'm talking about today I think are from the same collection which is The Truth About Magic. Honestly this first poem just sums up pretty much all of his writing in one place. There's not really anything new in any of his other poems, it's all just said in this one. No, I'm, not, I'm not even joking. There will always be that moment when we look at someone for the first time in love with them. That's it. So it's one sentence split up over three lines for no apparent reason with pretty bad grammar. There is some ambiguity here because of the bad grammar. So does he mean you love them the first time you look at them? Or is he talking about the first time you look at them after you realise you love them? Who knows? It's ambiguous, but really, who cares? This is just a poem describing the act of looking at someone. And actually, no, it's not. He's not describing anything. It's just simply stating that the act of looking someone has happened. That's it. There's no description. There's nothing. It's, it's absolutely nothing. And that's why this work is lazy, because there's nothing to it. It doesn't describe anything. It doesn't set any scene. It doesn't provide us with a viewpoint. It's certainly not an original one. It provides no depth, no meaning, nothing interesting, nothing to pick apart, nothing to read into. It's just like, yeah, you know, when you look at someone, that's it. That is it. And all any of this book does is vaguely point towards an incredibly generic situation and then lets the reader fill in literally the entire scenario for themselves. A good writer will share their own point of view in their work and then ask for yours and start a dialogue, whether you realise that's happening or not. And it's not explicit. I'm not saying like the, the writer will say, and my thought is this and this and this, what do you think? I mean it's subtle, a good piece of writing shares their viewpoint and invites you to share your own as well in your own way. A bad writer can't do that and won't do that and makes you do it all yourself, as is happening here. This piece of writing means absolutely nothing on its own. The only people who enjoy it are the ones who have their own thoughts and feelings and memories triggered from it. You're the one who's suddenly thinking about a specific person and how they make you feel and how you look at them, when you look at them, where their reaction, what they look like, that little smile they get when your eyes catch, how you feel your heartbeat racing and your tummy doing little backflips. You're the one who's imagining your breath catching in your throat and how you have to squint slightly because the sun was behind their head and they were glowing a little and you thought about how that suited them perfectly and all that stuff. You're the one who fills all that in. Atticus doesn't even point you in that direction. So if you enjoy these poems, if you get something out of them, it's because you're the creative one, not Atticus. And I don't think it's fair to give him any credit for the work you're doing. The writer isn't even doing anything to guide you there. This takes no more skill than when you're slightly drunk ant, and I use that as a term of endearment because that's exactly what I basically am. But it's like when your drunk ant posts on Facebook at 3am, oh, you know that moment when your dog just looks at you and sighs? Yeah. That's what this poetry is, and nothing more. This book is the poetry equivalent of buying a colouring book, except none of the pictures are drawn already, and someone's vomited on the pages, so you have to wipe all that vomit away, and then draw everything you want from scratch. Nick Laird and Don Patterson wrote in the introduction to their anthology, uh, The Zoo of the New, which was named after a, I think a Sylvia Plath poem, uh, what initially seems to be a poem's subject matter will often prove merely a pretext to write about something else, often something so elusive that the poem itself is the only record. And I can safely say this is not the case with any of Atticus's writing at all. To take another example from him, in which he at least attempts to start using some imagery, so this is mildly more interesting than the last at least, we get, she reminded me of dusk and the inevitable fading of all beautiful things. Okay, cool, so we almost have a metaphor here. Almost, not quite, almost. She reminds him of dusk, cool. All right, we can start thinking about that, except we can't because then he has to go and over explain it. It really is all or nothing with this guy. Half the fun of using metaphors in poetry and writing is that you make these inferences yourself. Most people know what dusk is, so you start to picture it. You think how it can be beautiful, but it also signifies an ending of the day. It's reliable and repetitive, but no two are ever the same. At dusk, you're often tired but reflective, and maybe you're thinking back through the things you did or didn't do that day. Maybe you've just seen a beautiful sunset, or maybe you've missed it. So what does this mean if you compare a person to dusk? Once you have a metaphor like that, there's so many interesting things you can think about, so many interesting interpretations, and the rest of the poem should provide more clues as to what the intent 
intended interpretation was, but also allow you to make your own conclusions and bring your own life experiences in there and interpret it in a way that's very personal to you. That's what good poetry does. That's not what Atticus does. He doesn't bother with this. He just tells you the one boring surface level interpretation that he meant and moves on. She reminded me of dusk and the inevitable fading of all beautiful things. Done. End of. Meh. It's boring. That said, using natural imagery to describe someone you love, or maybe just someone you're infatuated with, or someone you have a bit of a crush on, it doesn't have to be boring or straightforward at all. Me being a bit snarky again here, but one of my favourite negative reviews of Atticus's work on Goodreads wrote that there's also this cr trendy idea in it that loving the right person, as in the fitting hot person, and by hot we mean white blonde and long haired, perhaps with some freckles, is there to cure all the stuffs ever. <laughs> Which I think is just brilliant. And that leads me on very nicely to the first comparison I want to make. Because while Atticus seems like a real person who believes this stuff, and who does speak about and treat women in this way, or at least the narrator of his poems is, there was another fictional character who seemed to think like this, and it didn't end well for him. And we're going to be looking at a piece of writing from his perspective right now. So way back in the 1590s, Shakespeare wrote the iconic tragedy Romeo and Juliet, which is quite literally about youthful lust and infatuation, getting out of control and ending in death as most teen romances do, right? I joke, but Atticus's poems literally have the same tone as the 16-year-old hormone fueled Romeo who is melodramatic and over the top and doesn't bother to think anything through and he romanticizes this woman he barely knows and thinks she can solve everything in his life, you know? However, while Shakespeare wrote Romeo's character like this to mock him and critique him and, you know, this entire play is all about why this is wrong and it ends in tragedy. Atticus takes that point of view and romanticizes it further and is like, yeah, this is a beautiful thing. This is so cool and artsy. Everyone should think like this. Doesn't everyone think like this? And not only because of the perspectives, but in terms of execution, Shakespeare does it better, quite simply because his writing is excellent. Of course, it's meant to be over the top, Romeo's descriptions of Juliet are meant to be a bit cheesy and melodramatic because that's how teenage crushes are. Shakespeare captured this tone so well. When you look at his work, it's also just beautifully written with gorgeous imagery and extended metaphors and a whole host of well-executed poetic techniques. So one example I want to look at is from Act 2, Scene 2, in which Romeo stalks the 13-year-old child, Juliet, who he just met at a party. I'm not even joking. Guided by his penis, he sneaks to her house where he's a little tipsy and he stands in her garden and watches her on her balcony. And then he gives this little monologue, which is iconic, but also incredibly messed up when you actually think about the context. But it's meant to be. But soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady, oh, it is my love, oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. Oh, I'm too bold. It is not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars, as daylight doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were that glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. So I know it's a lot and it's written in a way that contemporary audiences might not be used to and might not understand. So before we jump into talking exactly about what's good about this piece, let's run through really quickly what's happening and what he's saying. So like I said, Romeo's a little bit drunk, he's just been at this party and he's met the 13 year old Juliet and he's followed her home and he's in her garden looking up at her balcony when he sees her come out through the, um, you know, like the balcony doors and she stood there 
brushing her hair a little bit. Her, her maid, her nurse, she's with her in the room. And Juliet's kind of talking to her a little bit, but she's out on the balcony and Romeo sees her. He starts, he compares her entrance to being as beautiful as the sunrise and says how she's far prettier than the moon, something which has often been associated with purity, and how she should kill the moon and cast off its vestal livery, which is another word for a chaste uniform, which basically means her virginity. Stop being a virgin. Seriously, he's like all these people who say you should keep your virginity, keep chaste, keep pure, they're all just jealous of you because they aren't as pretty as you. They're not as hot as you. They can't get men like you can. Cast off all that stuff and be with me. Go on, go on, sleep with me. You should. Not even joking. Literally what he's saying. And then he sees her talking to someone but he can't hear who and that's the nurse that's in the, in the room. And at first he thinks she's speaking to him because his ego's that big and then he realises that he can't possibly be because she doesn't know he's there and he's like, oh yeah, okay then, I get it. And then he goes on to describe her eyes and her face as being beautiful and blah blah and lots of comparisons to like stars and bright light and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then he finally says he wants to touch her so badly that he's jealous of her gloves which are touching her hands and cheeks. Oh, I wish I could be those gloves and be touching you right now. Fairly simple stuff, but beautifully written and considerably better than just what the Attica's equivalent would be, which is just, you're beautiful and on a balcony. I wish you were mine. So let's make a direct comparison here of the natural imagery in the original Atticus poem and the Shakespeare play verse extract, whatever you want to call it. Atticus says, she reminded me of dusk compared to just the first bit we get from Shakespeare, which is, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. She reminded me of dusk, it's just kind of weak, it's a bit like, Nyeh. She only reminds him of something natural, it's kind of wishy-washy, it's like, Nyeh. Shakespeare doesn't do that, Shakespeare is far more powerful. He, or Romeo even, makes the definitive statement that Juliet is the sun, it is far more powerful and it shows us that Romeo as a narrator is far more certain in his claim than Atticus as narrator. Atticus never sets up his metaphor either, he just says, yeah, she's like dust, and then that's it. What dusk? When? Why is she like dusk? Tell us what makes you think that. With Shakespeare, we can picture the whole scene and it's powerful. We picture the window, the balcony as the east and it's not just one tiny window. Right now, because of this description, it seems vast and important and it's Romeo's whole world. This is all he can focus on and look at. It's important. And the person he's looking at, Juliet, she's not just a five minute time of day. She is the sun. She is huge. She's important. You can't miss her. Her entrance is as is as important and as beautiful and as influential as sunrise itself. She is the bringer of light and life and warmth. She is strong and important and inspiring and beautiful. And Shakespeare is showing us all that. He's showing us that Romeo thinks all that without explicitly having to tell us. And this isn't just a standalone throwaway line either. He goes on to extend this metaphor and that gives it so much more strength. We get this juxtaposition of sun and moon imagery and Romeo as a character uses this not only to compliment Juliet, but to start thinking up ways to manipulate her into getting what he wants, which is to get her into bed. As the sun rises, the moon usually sets, so you get this dichotomy immediately. Sun and moon, light and dark, night and day, passion and chastity, health and sickness, brightness and paleness, joy and grief, fairness and enviousness. The juxtaposition of these contrasting ideas are all there throughout this entire passage, repeatedly. And then if this isn't enough, he takes it even further. His physical descriptions of her become comparisons to the stars and the heavens, again playing on this light and dark celestial theme. When Atticus tries to extend his comparison, all he can say is to explain what he just said. So this poem is three lines, all literally saying the same thing. His first line, and then his second two lines, say the exact same thing. He's repeating the same thing in different ways. Whereas Shakespeare never makes Romeo repeat stuff for the sake of it. Every time he extends the metaphor, it adds another layer to the meaning, and it's important that this whole passage has an extended metaphor, and not just a series of standalone metaphors or descriptions or images, because it makes the piece cohesive, which is really important. So Romeo could have said, you're like the sun, and anyone who says we shouldn't be together is so jealous they're green like the grass, and your eyes are as beautiful as diamonds. And technically it would have the same meaning, he's still 
making a comparison to the sun and saying she's important. He's saying people who don't want you to sleep with me are just jealous. He's saying, yeah, your eyes are really beautiful and shiny. He's saying all the same things, but none of those things connect. So it would feel like a whole bunch of random fleeting thoughts jumping around all over the place. But when you do what Shakespeare did and you have this theme throughout of sun and moon and night and day and light and dark and stars and sky and morning and daylight and sunrise and so on, it becomes this beautiful, cohesive, well thought out piece, which is so much more powerful as a whole. And this connects to the rest of the play too, because again, this isn't just a standalone descript description. You see the juxtaposition of light and dark recur as a theme throughout the entire play. So this passage, this little monologue here, works not only as an excellent standalone self-contained piece of writing, but as part of the larger play as a whole. It is genius. Shakespeare isn't the only one to absolutely kill it with natural metaphors though, and someone who wrote about a similar theme to this around the same time, but in a slightly different way, was John Donne in his poem The Good Morrow. Um, I love John Donne, I think he's wonderful. His work is excellent, and I see how it's intimidating because a lot of his language, and he's very big on having quite a like formal structure to a lot of his poems and stuff, and it can be intimidating for someone who's new to poetry to get into it, but I think he's well worth the effort to, you know, really think through his stuff, figure out what he means, figure out what he says, put some time into it, it pays off. Anyway, not the point. So his poem, The Good Morrow. This actually has a lot of similarities to Shakespeare, but while Romeo is this hormonal kid just trying to get a girl to sleep with him, Dunn is more mature in his approach, and he's saying how sex can be a beautiful and transformative experience, and he compares the joy of waking up next to someone you've just been intimate with as being as beautiful and influential as a religious epiphany. And he uses similar natural imagery, but in a much more subtle way. So not only is this poem set at sunrise, when two lovers wake after spending a night together, but in the last stanza he writes, my face in thine eyes, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? And just in the stanza before this, he was saying how it's like they have their own little world together, and now he's describing how when they wake up and look at each other, they see each other reflected back in the other's eyes. It's like they're each seeing a sunrise in the other's eyes, they're each being the sunrise for each other, they're both getting something out of it. And again, think back to the connotations of sunrises when we were talking about Shakespeare, how comparing someone to a rising sun makes them seem strong and nourishing, and like you're a light in someone's life, and so on. Dunn is saying that once you've been intimate with someone, once you have this wonderful connection, it's like you're all of those things to the other person and they're all of th those things to you. It's a very mutual thing. And the other thing of beauty about this poem is that not only does it have gorgeous imagery, but it's all written in iambic pentameter, which means that basically each line consists of 10 syllables with a stress on every other syllable. So this is not only incredibly tricky to write in, and so it shows a lot of skill, but it's done with purpose too. A lot of sonnets are written in iambic pentameter like this, some say because it mimics a heartbeat, which makes it particularly appropriate for emotional poems, and specifically love poems. But if you'd like to hear more about that, I have an intro to poetry video that goes into rhyme and rhythm in a lot more detail, and meter in a lot more detail, so you can go check that out if you want. And like I say, what I really like about this Dunn poem is that it's, a far, it's far more equal and mutual than anything Atticus has ever written, and also any of the stuff Shakespeare was writing in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo is a typical teenager, and it's all about how, what can I get out of this girl? How can I convince her to do what I want? Atticus is just a typical modern douchebag of, let me objectify this girl and forget she's a real complex woman, you know? Dunn is more realistic, and he's a lot fairer. He's like, look babes, we're in a relationship, this is about both of us and what we can give to each other. I'm not just gonna take from you, I'm not just gonna tell you you're great, we're both gonna create something wonderful and beautiful and special together absolute legend. That's what I love about John Donne. Don't get me wrong though, he could be a bit of a lad at times too. He has this entire poem about trying to get a woman to sleep with him. Bye. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. He's like, but look, the fly bit you and then the fly bit me. Our blood has mixed inside this fly. The fact that this fly has bitten both of us basically means we're connected now. We've already shared bodily fluids, so we might as well do it in every other way now, by having sex. He's great, he's such a lad. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's funny though, but on the whole, yeah, no, a lot of his stuff was very nice. 
he was an absolute lad, but you could tell at the same time he did actually care about women's enjoyments and their feelings too, and letting them get something out of it as well, which is always appreciated. Anyway, back to the topic of poetry, and let's talk about meter slightly, because of course not every poem has to be an iambic pentameter, not every poem even has to have a set meter or rhythm at all, but even when a good poem is written in free verse, its structure tends to have meaning and purpose. It's not just words thrown on a page for the sake of it, you know? A good poet will use a poem's rhythm to make it flow and express a point. They'll choose elements of structure and form to show their meaning, as well as the content of the poem. But sadly, there's just none of that in Atticus's work at all. So to take another example from his books, he traced her silhouette with moonlight, and found in the stars the calligraphy of her soul. So to briefly look at the content, it makes no sense. It's mixing metaphors in a way that is just pure nonsense. He traced her silhouette in the moonlight. Okay, cool, doesn't mean much on its own, but it's setting something up, we'll run with it. And found in the stars, okay, now we're looking up at the night sky. I guess you have moonlight and stars, some coherency there, cool. The calligraphy of her soul. What the hell does that even mean? Calligraphy has nothing to do with moonlight and stars, it has nothing to do with tracing. Calligraphy is about fancy handwriting and lettering. Nothing in this poem has had anything to do with writing so far, so this just completely comes out of nowhere and makes no sense. I did wonder at first if he'd like mixed it up with constellations? I don't know, maybe. But what the hell does calligraphy of the soul even mean? Her soul's written in fancy lettering? Her, t her soul took some practice to write? It makes no sense. So in the examples we've looked at so far, he's gone from simply stating an action, to over explaining a basic metaphor, to now complete nonsense that makes no sense. Metaphor should still make sense, and this one doesn't. He's taken a bunch of buzzwords and shoved them together and called it poetry. It means nothing, just like everything Atticus writes. But anyway, sorry, not what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about structure and form for a moment, because this poem has none. Nothing intentional anyway. He simply hits enter after every short phrase, and that doesn't make something a poem. Although, if you do like jokes about that, I have this really cool merch you should check out about how anyone can be a poet. It's funny, I like it. Good poems have an intentional structure, yes, even in free verse. Where a good poet chooses to end their lines means something. Traditionally, poems had end stop lines, which means that each line in a poem is a full, complete, syntactic unit, uh, which basically means a full sentence or phrase or whatever, and it would be ended with punctuation. So each line ends where there'd be a natural pause anyway. This tends to slow down the poem a bit, give it a predictable structure, it makes it easier for the reader to digest and think about, and it has a whole range of uses depending on the poem. Continuing with the theme of describing love interests, a great example of an end stop poem which is actually good, and on this topic, is Langston Hughes's My Loves, which was written in around the 1920s-ish, I want to say. I love to see the big white moon a-shining in the sky. I love to see the little stars when shadow clouds go by. I love the raindrops falling on my rooftop in the night. I love the soft wind sighing before the dawn's grey light. I love the deepness of the blue in my lord's heaven above. But better than all these things, I think, I love my lady love. Super simple poem, but it's lovely and it's sweet. And again, so many of the same themes as Atticus's work, but all done better. You've got a female subject who's a love interest, natural imagery, but here we have a deliberate structure. We have three stanzas of four lines each, which are called quatrains, in which the second and fourth line of each stanza rhyme. Hughes was a huge fan of jazz and blues music, and I don't blame him, I am too, and clearly this influenced his poetry and his writing, and you can almost hear the rhythm and the melody in this poem and so much of his other work. It's smooth, it's calming, it's not exactly predictable, but it's reliable and it works well for this poem. It's really, really well done. But of course, not every poem has to be end-stopped like this. The alternative, which many poets choose, especially today, is to use enchantment, which basically means a sentence or thought or phrase runs over from one line of a poem to the next without punctuation to end it. And this is what Atticus does, but without any real purpose. Generally, when a poet uses enjambment, it tends to affect the overall pacing of the poem, it often speeds it up, or it's to simulate natural sp speech patterns, other times poets use it to emphasise certain words or phrases, or maybe like put in bits on lines of their own, makes the reader pause in slightly unnatural places, or focus on one bit over another. 
lots and lots of reasons why you'd use enchantment, don't know why Atticus is doing it. <laughs> We've already seen some examples of good enchantment in The Good Morrow, but another example would be Yehuda Amachai's Songs for a Woman, which uses almost constant enchantment and a very interesting overall structure. So once again, I'm choosing to compare this to Atticus's work because at least the first bits feature descriptions of a woman. I won't read the poem as a whole, it's like a whole piece. Um, very, very good though. But to take the first couple of stanzas from the first section, because this is relevant to the Theme that we're talking about today. Your body is white like sand in which children never played. Your eyes beautiful and sad like illustrated flowers in a school book and then so on and so on. So as you can see each stanza is sort of a different phrase or unit but it spreads across two lines and what's important here is that the line breaks have not been thrown in randomly at all. The first line is used to paint a picture and make the reader think of something and then the second line is used to add detail and meaning. The enjambment causes the reader to slow down in unnatural places and really think about these descriptions. So it's not just your body's white like sand that children play in. It's no, your body is white like sand. Okay, pause here. So we know she's pale, we have that picture in our mind. We're wondering why, what does this mean? Why does he like this? Does he like this at all? In which children never played. Okay, so now we're picturing smooth, soft, undisturbed sand. So we're picturing maybe her skin being smooth, unblemished. She's beautiful, he likes that. But the mention of children playing also alludes to the fact she's probably a virgin. Maybe he thinks of her as quite pure in that respect, or at least she's never had children. So maybe he sees her as young. Again, maybe pure, we're getting this unblemished image coming back. And we're also starting to wonder why. Does he like this? Is this a good thing? Is this something he's praising? And if so, why does he like it? Your eyes are beautiful and sad. End of the line. We pause, we picture these eyes, we start to wonder why she might be sad. And also beautiful and sad, you don't normally have those things together. Are they beautiful because she's sad or despite the fact she's sad? Like illustrated flowers in a school book. Adds in more detail, starts to give us meaning. And there's a lot you can read into this. I think it's a beautiful image. He's comparing her to art, but with a limit because he's saying you're beautiful, but not necessarily natural beauty like a real flower, like an illustrated flower. Flowers illustrated in school books, they're pretty, but ultimately they're not real, so you'll never be as beautiful as them. And also, it's a school book. This isn't just art for art, art's sake, this is art to teach and learn from. So is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Beautiful, but sad. It's something that's pretty to look at, but also for a reason that most people might find a little bit boring and dull beautiful and sad. It's multi-layered, it's very very interesting, I think it's fantastic. And the use of enchantment and line breaks in this piece is so important because it slows down how we process and think of these descriptions. It feeds us what he's meaning slowly, piece by piece, letting us learn a little bit more, bit by bit. Each line takes the information we've been given and then adds a little more to it. We don't get this with Atticus, the line breaks aren't there with purpose, they're just thrown in at random. He traced. Okay, and? Her silhouette. Okay, now we have an object to go with our action. With moonlight, now we just have a very bored reader. And found in the stars. Like, there's no point to where these line breaks are. They don't make sense. But, okay, let's try to give him the benefit of the doubt and let's choose a slightly longer poem to see if the line breaks in this have any purpose. Don't move an inch in this morning light. Should you smudge? the beautiful I see. I want to paint you every curve with words and place you on the mantle of my soul as the forever memory of dawn. No, it's still not good. For one, I don't like the use of beautiful as a noun. Should you smudge the beautiful? It, ugh, no, gross, no. But again, we're talking about structure. So like the firm first line isn't bad, you know, don't move an inch. Having that as one line and the line break, it's fine, it makes sense. A command and then a pause, it drives it home. But then he kind of ruins it because it's not actually the whole command. He goes on to say in this morning light and then gives a reason of should you smudge the beautiful I see. He just keeps dragging it out and it kind of weakens the original punchiness of that don't move an inch as the original command. That sharp imperative is just undermined by the rest of it and eh. Also, I don't understand why he's got a line break after smudge. Should you smudge the beautiful I see? Why is the line break there? 
Also, weird syntax just for the sake of it. It just screams pretentiousness and I don't enjoy it. Sometimes when a poet's trying to adhere to a strict structure of rhythm or meter or like a form or whatever, then they'll play around with unusual syntax to make their meaning fit the form they're trying to go for. And syntax, if you're not familiar with it, is just very simply, it means the order or arrangement of words in a sentence or phrase or whatever. So sometimes poets will play around with unusual syntax in order to keep the rhythm they want or keep the form they want or keep the rhymes they want and so on. So for example, take the first few lines of this Christina Rossetti poem. I wish I could remember that first day, first hour, first moment of your meeting me. If bright or dim the season, it might be summer or winter for aught I can say. So the Rossetti poem in general is very, very sweet. It's about how as you get older, you seem to forget about the little things like when you first met someone and how she wishes she could like remember all those little moments like the first kiss and the first meeting and stuff like that. And you'll notice in some ways and throughout the rest of the poem, the syntax is a little unusual in places. You probably wouldn't phrase things like this in everyday speech. Like you wouldn't start with if bright or dim the season to say like, oh, I can't remember what season it was, you know? So it's not like everyday speech. The syntax is unusual because she's trying to stick to her A, B, B, A rhyme scheme and using I am pentameter. So she's sticking to this and it works. That's why she has the unusual syntax and that's why it pays off. But when Attica says, don't move should you smudge the beautiful I see. It both doesn't sound natural and has no purpose. There's no rhyme or rhythm he's trying to stick to. There's no structure he's trying to stick to. It just sounds weird for the sake of it. It's very odd. At this point, we've compared a lot of poems with Atticus's and we've discussed metaphors and imagery and meter and rhythm and form and structure. But do you notice one thing that all of these good poems do that Atticus never does? They get specific while Atticus always stays as vague as possible. Now I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning of the video, but I wanna talk about it more in a little more detail. There's something in poetry that some people call the great paradox, which basically states that the more specific something is, the more universal it becomes, which means the more specific of a situation you describe, the more people can relate to it. Even if they haven't been in that exact situation, they start to pick up on the feelings, the emotions, what people must be picturing and going through and how they're feeling, and they can relate to that. They can relate to someone maybe crying over their lost child more than they can just relate to a person crying. Even if they've never lost a child themselves, they can relate to those feelings of loss and they can empathize and know how they must be feeling. A person crying, they're like, well, they're just crying, how am I supposed to know how sad they are? Do you know what I mean? So to look back at examples in some of these poems so far, John Donne doesn't just tell us how great love and sex is, he does it by describing the very specific act of waking up next to your lover in the morning and looking at them. Shakespeare doesn't just say, oof, teenagers, they're full of hormones, right? He does it by having this 16 year old boy watch a child on her balcony and describe how he would try and convince her to sleep with him by comparing her to the sun and the moon. It's very specific. <laughs> Hughes doesn't just say, you know what, I love you more than anything. He does it very specifically by describing all these beautiful, wonderful things that he loves and then saying, but I love you more than that. He gets specific. Atticus never does this. Everything stays as generic as possible. And this is a big issue I have with his poetry and Instagram poetry in general, because like I said earlier, they think if they're vague, they'll appeal to a bigger audience because you do all the work filling in the gaps and it's all gaps. <laughs> But this doesn't make for good poetry or good art. It doesn't even make for all that relatable work. They're going about this in completely the wrong way. Go back and read Yehuda Amachai's Songs for a Woman again and tell me everything you learn about that woman he's describing and everything you learn about the narrator and you'll see that even in that short poem, there are fleshed out characters and scenarios and situations. For another example, here's an incredibly short but fun poem called From the Irish by Ian Duhigg or Duhigg, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who, fun fact, went to Leeds Uni. I live in Leeds now. It's uh, something you don't really probably care about, but I found it fun. <laughs> Anyway, I chose this because again, it's on the same topic of describing someone you're attracted to, but what I love about this poem is one, he gets specific, two, the imagery is beautiful, three, it completely inverts all expectations and what you'd expect, and it seems like it shouldn't be flattering, but it is really lovely. 
According to Deneen, a gale unsurpassed in lexicographical enterprise, the Irish for moon means the white circle in a slice of half-boiled potato or turnip. A star is the mark on the forehead of a beast, and the sun is the bottom of a lake or well. Well, if I say to you, your face is like a slice of half-boiled turnip, your hair is the colour of a lake's bottom, and at the centre of each of your eyes is the mark of a beast, it is because I want to love you properly, according to Deneen. And it's so specific. We learn about the narrator and the person he's describing and their background and their heritage and what's important to them and there's just so much. I'm going to read you a selection of Atticus poems now and I want to see if you can get anywhere near as much information from any of these. <laughs> Number one. She stood there bathing in the grand forests of his love with only the quiet rustle of the treetops against the sky to remind her she was real at all. Number two. Somewhere in the great landscape of time, there is a garden growing the most beautiful rose that has ever been and that ever will be. You are that rose forever to me. Number three. She was a queen, safe and unconquerable in the wild, walled kingdoms of herself. Do you see what I mean though about how these could all be the same poem? There's nothing to distinguish between them. They're just very, very samey. But also you're not getting any information out of these. They're so generic. Why was she a queen? What made her this way? Why was she like a wild walled kingdom? Does that mean she keeps to herself? Why? Does narrator want to conquer her? Is he okay leaving her alone? Why is he even talking about her? We learn nothing. Final one. I find more love in a storm with you than a thousand sunny days without. What is the point? I get the impression with all these Instagram poets, as I call them, and if you want to see more about what I mean by that, because I don't just mean a poet posting on Instagram. Instagram poetry is a very specific type of poetry that I refer to, and I have this video on it if you want to go check that out for yourself. But I have a feeling a lot of these Instagram poets, including Atticus, are trying to create books and content which are purely aphorism. So aphorism is a term which refers to statements, usually in writing, which are short and witty but reveal a truth. So they often relate to moral or philosophical topics and they can be quite humorous. I'm showing my age a bit here, but does anyone remember way back in like the early 2000s when there was this meme of people posting random quotes all over the internet and attributing them to Oscar Wilde? Even when it was stuff that he clearly didn't say. He'd be like, oh, the new Star Wars film is great, Oscar Wilde. That, you know, that sort of stuff. It would mostly be on like your MySpace pages or um, signatures on web forums or, um, oh, what was it called? You know, that like parody encyclopedia, kind of like a parody Wikipedia. There was a lot of stuff on there. I can't, I can't remember the name now, but it's because Oscar Wilde, genius as he was, was pretty well known for coming out with a lot of aphorisms and people wanting to pretend to be like cultured or who were just a bit pretentious would often share a bunch of wild quotes, you know, on their MySpace pages, on their um, signatures and stuff. Um, I guess kind of in the same way that you see people posting Insta poetry now on their stories and stuff. And people wanted to take the mick out of that. So, y you know, that's what they would do. But internet culture aside, like I say, wild was and still is to some extent known for his aphorisms. You know, stuff like, um, I've got some examples here. The only thing that one really knows about human nature is that it changes. A man who does not think for himself does not think at all. There is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about and that is not being talked about. You know that kind of thing. And I get the impression that people like Atticus, people like R.H. Thin, uh, D-Man, Sherry Averett, a certain YouTuber, all these people whose poetry I've reviewed or will review and so on, I feel like they're attempting to just create content of aphorisms and nothing else. But it's not working for a number of reasons because one, there's a bad. Two, most popular and good aphorisms weren't written as aphorisms. They weren't written as standalone little lines thrown out into the world. They weren't one-liners. Most of these things were included in longer poems, in essays, in speeches. They're small sections of a bigger piece of writing. And three, just most people aren't Oscar Wilde. That man was a genius and few people come close to his, you know, command of the English language. <laughs> so I feel like most people see these like quotes from people like Wilde and so on taken out of context and they think, well, that's what poetry is. I'll try and do that. But it's not working because they're not writing these quality little lines as part of a big overall quality piece of writing. They're not really understanding what the quality is in these and why they're useful. An aphorism alone isn't poetry. 
and poetry isn't just aphorisms, you know? So I think there's a misunderstanding there. I think, I feel like this is what they're attempting and they're just going about it all wrong and it just ends up with us having a lot of poor quality writing out there in the world, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah, anyway, okay. I think that might be me done. That's the end of my notes for now on this section. I'm very exhausted by this video. I've been filming for a really, really long time. I've been filming for like an hour and a half now, I think, so I don't know how long this video is gonna be. But at this point, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about Atticus's work and Instagram poetry in general? Let me know what you think about the poems that we compared him to and also what other criticisms you have of his work, his writing, or if you like it, let me know why and what you get out of it. Um, I genuinely mean that. I, I, probably sounded snarky than I meant to with that, like, oh, tell me what you get out of it. No, I mean, please tell me what you get out of it. I'm interested to know. I'm, your tone is so hard. Anyway, this has been a really long video, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna end this now. If you'd like to check out my Bad Poetry merch, you can do, it's all available on my merch store. It's really cool, it's really fun, I love it. If you'd like poetry recommendations, please check out my website. I also have art prints over there and photography prints and all kinds of fun stuff. And there's also just lots of my uh, photography and art and stuff that you can check out for yourself if you're interested in that. But for now, thank you for watching, I appreciate you a hell of a lot and I'll see you again really, really soon.